Why did I order a bicycle chain, which you see here still in the box? A couple of reasons. One, because it's a forgotten impact weapon, hence part of the video's title. And two, because I want to make this as a thank you to Matt Menefee, forensic science teacher and backer of my next book, Deadly Ingenuity. And I am happy to be the first person to capture the history of these right here, because yeah, they were a common street flexible impact weapon. And the flexible impact weapons of the West are kind of my specialty. I wrote the only book ever about them. But why would anyone have ever used these as a fighting tool? Well, because it's pretty effective, as we're going to see with some hands-on tests. But, you know, this is a matter of street carry, EDC type use, youth gangs, people with not a lot of money. You could acquire one of these pretty easily. Now, a bicycle chain is a chain, and were chains used on the street? Well, of course they were, so, you know, why bother to use this kind? I'm not 100% sure. The thing with this kind of instrument and its users is that people didn't really bother to write these things down. But their history is real if overlooked. In fact, I would guess the average martial artist and even weapons geek has never heard of a bicycle chain being used in self-defense or offense. But as we're going to see, they have a deep history. So... Let's play around with this one here for a second first. It's about a handful, as you can tell. When I fully extend it, it's, oh, I'd say five feet long. And yes, it is greasy, but not anywhere near as greasy as I would have expected. I'm going to give it a nice bath with soap and water before continuing the hands-on stuff. Bicycles have, of course, not been around forever. And see that 1870 model there? That's the kind of old-timey bike we think of as the originals. Not They weren't actually, but they were the first popular ones. However, they had limited appeal because people would fall off of them and get hurt. You're so high up. It was the 1885 version that you see here in the diagram. I don't know if that was the exact year, but that's when the modern bicycle was born. And then they really took off in popularity. People would go riding bikes all the time. And that means a lot of bicycles, and that means a lot of bicycle chains. And so we're talking about the latter part of the 19th century, when we're looking for when these would have started getting used on the street. And to that point, notice how this older version here doesn't even have a chain. You just powered the one main wheel, and that moved the whole thing. Now, the gangs of the Victorian era and beyond would use whatever they could find, as in this illustration, for their violent purposes. Lead pipes, gas pipes were easily acquired, and they made great cudgels, a gas coupling, you could close your fist around, use it as a fist pack, a straight razors, you name it. So it's easy to see how the chain would have come into the mix, even if it seems like a strange choice. Uh, my friends and I were not gang members, uh, far from it, but even we, and I'm sure many people watching this video also can recall, uh, you know, as friends just experimenting with common objects and trying to turn them into weapons, that was quite a pastime. So if you're actually out there battling in the street all the time, you're probably going to do a lot of experimenting, and somebody realized that these things could be pretty handy. A knife is deadlier, for sure, and a straight stick, you know, any kind of a standard cudgel could be used for blocking, which you're not going to do with your chain, not if you're holding it in one hand, your bike chain. But it's got reach. How much reach depends on how many times you fold it up, I guess, in your hand. But it's got that. It has the flexibility. I mean, it's kind of a whip, so it has the energy-increasing flexibility. Yeah, I know it's not the exact same method as an actual bull whip like this with the tapering circumference, which allows it to break the speed of sound and all that good stuff. I just mean more generally the flexibility, that whipping motion, which is not going to feel good when a bicycle chain with all that extra speed, it connects with your skull. A shout out to whip maker David Morgan, whose name you can see up here, because he let me use a picture back in my first book. And of course, there are historical weapons that found this combination of traits useful as well, like most famously the Kusari Fundo from Japan. But even today, there's a variety, and I do mean a variety, of chain-based self-defense weapons. On a video note, let me mention that this is kind of a tough video to make only in that there are almost no useful images out on the entirety of the internet around bicycle chain as a weapon, which proves how overlooked this actual historical weapon is. So I'm just cycling through vaguely appropriate images for a bit. Let's do some historical tidbits. In 1954, a Scottish man was sentenced to three years in prison for assaulting a Glasgow movie theater manager with, you guessed it, a bike chain. The City Law School from City University London notes that someone was indicted. 
for carrying our item. Alexander Crossman on 24th November 2012, without lawful authority or reasonable excuse, had with him in a public place, namely Oxford Street, London, an offensive weapon, namely a bicycle chain. A book entitled Everything You Need to Know About Weapons in School and at Home, first published in 1994, mentions the bicycle chain. Our headline here says it all. Woman hit in face with bicycle chain by man wearing mask on subway platform in Manhattan. That's from 2020. Let's read from a naval memoir. This was written by a man who entered the service in 1959. South Indians kept sneaking in across the pack straight. They would come in by the boatload, women, children, even their dogs, while some hardy souls would make the crossing alone. One man who was found on a small islet had sat astride the trunk of a banana tree. All he carried was a bicycle chain and a little bundle of his meager belongings strapped to his back. When he was taken off by a Navy patrol, he was half dead of thirst. At the internment camp, he said the bicycle chain was his only weapon. Many carried such weapons to beat off the Navy men who had to seize them at sea. Not on shore, mind, for once ashore, arrest and deportation involved the usual lengthy legal procedure. I've used this picture and source before. In the 1950s, the El Paso Times, so that's El Paso, Texas, here in Texas, uh, brought in a large haul of youth gang weapons, as can be seen here. Now, let me quote from the article a couple of bits. Police think most parents must not even know the contents of their children's rooms or their own garages, or they would discover evidence of gang membership. Maybe a bicycle chain with one end wrapped with tape for a grip. From elsewhere in the article, they use knives, clubs, homemade blackjacks, and zip guns, and a weapon which has rapidly gained ascendancy in recent years, the bicycle chain. And that touches on something interesting that I've seen elsewhere in my research. You'll have weapons that are kind of like rediscovered. So they were used maybe a lot in a certain time and place, then kind of abandoned somewhat, and then a new generation, quote-unquote, discovers their usefulness. So then it's described in the press as a new fad. Now let me read a quick bit from a forensics textbook. Patterned abrasions are a special subset of pressure and impact abrasions, whereby the pattern of the object causing them is faithfully reproduced on the skin, enabling its identification. Examples. And then the very first example it lists is a bicycle chain. Let's move on to some hands-on testing. I've got an old catalog here. Nice and thick. You know, paper is actually very dense once you compress it like that, right? So, decent material to try. And boy, this is, it's just such a weird item. I mean, look at this. It gets these kinks in it. I don't know how somebody would unfurl this from their pocket fast enough to use, but we know for a fact they did. And when you get one of those kinks, it's not necessarily easy to undo it. It's a very long item. I mean, that you could swing it that way for sure, but I think... This would probably be the normal, probably be the normal length. See that? And it's weird because it's kind of a two-headed flail, if you think about it. Like a two-strand whip. I think having folded it this many times is probably the most combat-friendly version. Of course, you're giving up some length, but you can recover much quicker. And so let's give this a shot. I'm going to have to be accurate here because I only have a few inches where it runs over past the trash can. And while we would have gotten the same result with all kinds of items, here's the interesting part. Just what we were reading about a moment ago, the unique pattern caused by the shape. And I know that doesn't look like a ton of damage, but keep in mind it's only one of the two types that this weapon delivers. We heard that nice, satisfying smack sound from the impact that was delivered. Now we're going to go to the other side, and again, just a very odd item. Notice, it's just naturally kinked up, and if I could keep it like that on the end, well then, yeah, you would do that, but see, it just constantly, it has a mind of its own, and then when you get kind of a knot or whatever you want to call those, those big kinks, you could say, like, oh, I'd use that like as a, as a mace head, perfect, but then it undoes itself two seconds later. It's just really, really odd. Like this, if I wanted to keep it that way. And of course you could with some oh, good old duct tape, you name it. 
uh, but I don't have evidence that that kind of thing was done. And still, with a little wire, string, tape, you could definitely come up with your own beefed up configuration. And going back to length for a moment, notice I'm going to fold it in half. It's about a, it's about five feet long. I think I mentioned that before. I'm going to fold it in half and then wrap it a little bit around my hand for retention. And then you've got a pretty long flail. Not crazy long, but much longer than what I was using a moment ago. Possible fist use there. Would that be a good idea? No, I don't think so. More of a raking motion if I was going to have to use it that way. And even though it's not a good idea, I'm sure that happened <laughs> over time. Here's the oddest thing about this. Notice it stiffens in one direction on one vector and then swings freely in the other. So you definitely want to wield it so that you're maximizing the flexibility. Oh, look, I've got a kink in there that would help, right? At the very end, if it would stay in place. And with this extended length, that'd be kind of frightening. Get this just right. By the way, no, it, it undid itself anyway. So here we are at like twice the length, half the width, right? We're going to give it a go. And well, I can tell you, I wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of that at all. And this was pretty cool. Check this out in comparison to the first time. It's a very consistent pattern. And we can even see how far down it went. <laughs> Look at that. It's like paper dolls. And you know, I know that doesn't seem like a lot, but again, it actually is very dense stuff when it's layered together the paper. And to prove that point, I did this off camera because I didn't know if it would be too violent for YouTube. I executed a knife slash with a nice sharp knife. Same object, same swing range, same configuration, you know, the setup with the trash can and all that. And it did not cut through anywhere near as much as the chain. And the important point there is a knife, an edged weapon, pretty much only slashes. That's the only damage it delivers. Where, as we just talked about, the chain is mostly an impact weapon. So this is just gravy here. And even in that respect, it outperformed the knife. Don't get me wrong, is a knife a more effective weapon? Well, if it gets wielded against the parts of the body where it's meant to be targeted against as a fighting implement, then of course. And you saw my little pinky loop improvised retention system there, just to make sure it doesn't fly out of my hand. Here's what I was talking about before. Looks like a magic trick. Just stiff as a board in one direction, swings freely in the other. Not a lot of weapons can we, can we name that do that. And by the way, if you're in a pinch, you can swing it against the grain, so to speak, kind of like a slapjack, the flat way, but it's not as effective. I'm back to the shorter range, thicker version, as you can tell, and let's try against this empty but stout shipping tube. And yes, I'm filming in slow motion, as you can tell. Well, no surprise that it went flying away, but how much damage did we do to this freestanding object? And there's the telltale pattern. And yeah, it dented the surface. This container is much tougher than you might think. Like, I put both hands on it and squeezed as hard as I could and could barely get it to yield. Kind of feels like a light wood, almost. To that point, let's work the knuckles. Notice they're nice and undamaged. So that was many, many, I didn't count, simulated punches to approximate what the chain did in one. And as you can tell, like I said, that tube is tough. You can see the evidence on my skin. I don't know if the red comes through as clearly as it did in real life. I'm trying a single strand strike just for the hell of it. And it kind of kinks up even just with that one motion. I didn't cut my head off from view on purpose. It just worked out that way and it's fine. Here's the wrap and long version of the weapon that I was showing earlier. Got a little bit more space to work with. And it feels good. It feels intuitive. Hitting the spots I intend to. Easy to use, I would say. Lashing out from a still, ready position. It gets out there fast. Not as fast as a pair of nunchaku. As I've shown in a previous video, they have an unparalleled ability to go from 0 to 100. 
And there's another one of those kinks. Let's skip ahead so you don't watch me untangling it. Notice here I accidentally ended up with two loops, two kinks, at the bottom of the two individual strands. That would actually be perfect if it would stay that way. Yeah. That adds some serious power because it's that extra mass and it's at the very end of this long connection. Well, like I said earlier, there would be various ways to jury rig whatever particular configuration you want with this thing. You know, I mentioned the nunchaku, and just like the nunchaku, this was used as an ambush tool, straight out of the pocket and onto the opponent's head. Now to close out our experimenting, let's go up against a tile. I had to readjust it, hence the edit right there, because I didn't have enough swing space. And let's give it a shot. And just a moderate swing demolished it. I counted at 10 individual pieces, because yes, I did collect them and throw them away. And the bicycle chain, definitely a forgotten impact weapon. And to that point, I think the video you're watching, mine, is the first one ever to deal with the chain, the bicycle chain, as an actual historical weapon. Now, which, like I said, fits hand in glove with my specialty as a researcher. But what you find online are just, you know, modern fantasy inventions like this. Or this, using more than one bicycle part to make a weapon, which I'm, I would say probably never ever existed. You know, fun experiment, sure. Speaking of fun experiments, can you forge a functional knife out of a bicycle chain? Well, you can if you're this guy. Pretty cool. But nothing about the historical reality. Even one of my favorite YouTubers, Matt, from Scala Gladiatoria, calls this what he's holding here. You know, you can see the flail that happens to use a bike chain, an obscure weapon. Well, no, that's not an obscure weapon. That's a fantasy weapon. I guess I'll go ahead and mention then it was made by Todd, one of my other favorite YouTubers from Todd's Workshop. I actually credit him in my upcoming weapons book for his uh, plumbata experiments, but anyway. And the point is, these things were actually real and used on the street. For well over 100 years and across many countries and continents. And if you didn't know, now you do, because that's what we do in this channel. Well, at least some of the time. Once again, huge thank you to Matt, who not only supports my work, but invited me to present with him at a forensic science conference. That thing that I posted about recently, which was really cool. As always, thanks for watching.